Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us our returning guest and fellow sheath underwear model, Corey DeAngelis, who's National Director of Research for the American Federation for Children. Corey, thanks for joining me today for another special all hunk edition of your welcome. Uh, but what I'm really excited to talk to you about is you are probably the biggest dispenser of white pills out there today because it has been your work to promote school choice for children. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go hard left for a second, because I think something that libertarians don't acknowledge enough is that when people are faced with extreme poverty, that may not affect someone's freedom in a um, uh, legal sense, but it does affect their choices. When you were working 12 hours a day, you got to feed for your kids, you got to commute to work, where every dollar counts, that really does have some material effect on, on your freedom. And in addition to this, the best way to get out of that situation for young people is to be educated, is to have discipline, is to demonstrate when I go into that office, you can rely on me to perform maybe not an A plus level, but if I'm a solid B and as an employee, I'm really at the top of the pack. What I think they get wrong is that the hard left understands how monopolies are deleterious, how they're, have all the incentives with the monopolies are perverse and work at the expense of everybody else. And they are in favor of making education a government monopoly. So do you agree with everything I've said just far, so far? Yep, yep. And, and in addition to that, it's also a libertarian position to fund the students directly, especially since we already are spending the taxpayer funding. This is an, an additional taxpayer expense. It's just reallocating the funding from the government buildings to the individual students, and then they can pick where to take the funding. So I, it, from following your Twitter and your work, it has seemed to me that the government education monopoly for young people and children specifically has really taken a massive hit uh, during the COVID times, which is some silver lining during a very obviously period where a lot of people died and a lot of business closed and so on and so forth. Can you talk about how, I know this is going to, it's a broad question, so you're going to have a long answer, how the educational system has changed as a consequence of COVID? Yeah, the system is, uh, is pretty much the same, right? But the problems inherent in that government-run monopolized system have become exposed over the last couple of years now. The way that I've put it before is that COVID didn't break the government school system, it was already broken. I mean, it's one thing for a government-run institution to continue getting your children's education dollars, regardless of how well they do and regardless of your choice in the matter, but it's another conversation altogether for that same government-run building to continue to receive your children's education dollars, regardless of whether they even open their doors for business. So families were scrambling, trying to find private alternatives that were much more likely to be open in person since the start of all of this. Uh, and the government buildings just kept the money. They were closed. You had board members in the Chicago Teachers Unions uh, vacationing in Puerto Rico in person while railing against going back to work in person. So this is this all kind of clicked for families with the school closures that the money goes to closed buildings doesn't make any sense. But then another part of this is this uh, aspect of remote learning, which I don't even really like to call remote learning. There, there were school closures. If we want to call it anything, maybe uh, remotely learning because there was so much academic learning loss when it came to these school closures, or maybe we just call it remote instruction. But the one benefit of government schools trying to do this remote learning or instruction was that parents got to see what was going on in the classroom. Right. And that, that sparked an entire new argument, or at least mobilized parents in a new way to support the funding following the child, And is that a lot of the parents who had their kids into A-rated public schools or, or schools that their kids were doing okay and, and received all, all A's and passed their standardized test scores, those same families started to see that their government schools aren't as good as they thought they were because they started to see a new dimension of school quality, which happens to be the curriculum and the values. Uh, and a lot of these families started to see that they don't want their kids sent to this school and they don't want to be forced to pay for this institution where they feel like their kids are being indoctrinated for 13 years of their life. And so in 2021, we've seen a massive explosion of school choice. 2021 was the year of school choice or the year that we fund students, not systems. 19 states enacted or expanded programs to fund students 
as opposed to systems in 2021. And this year in 2022, we already have 24 states at least. There's going to be more bills dropping this week, but it's at least 24 states with active new legislation to consider expanding programs to fund students as opposed to systems. So 2021 was the year of school choice, but we're just getting started and families are fighting back more than ever. And I think we're going to have even more success because parents aren't going to unsee what they saw in 2020 and in 2021, and they're going to fight to make sure they never feel powerless ever again going forward. You know, one of the points I made, and maybe this is kind of uh, punching down, but I don't think it is, is TikTok, I think, has demonstrated to many parents just what's going on in their schools because you see some of these teachers bloviating on TikTok, which is, of course, they're right. And one doesn't have to have any political perspective, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever you want to call it, to look at this person and be like, okay, I don't want this person having authority over my child because this is not, I don't feel comfortable with how this person speaks in general. And certainly my child and this person would not have a comfortable uh, a situation. Do, have you heard yeah. how social media has been fueling uh, kind of this blowback against government schooling? Yeah, this is helpful in a way as well that all these videos are surf surfacing on, on Twitter. I mean, there's the libs of TikTok uh, account, which is great. And you know what? There's there's so many problems that have kind of bubbled up in battles, I guess, with, with K-12 education since March of 2020. We've, we've seen fights over remote versus, uh, remote versus in per in-person instruction. We've seen battles over, do we force all kids to wear masks in the schools or do we uh, have a choice on the part of the parents? Do we have this curriculum or that curriculum? Do we have uh, vaccine requirements for kids or not? I would argue all these things are just symptoms of the larger problem, which happened to be a one size fits all government school system. And I, as a libertarian, I don't really care all that much what type of curriculum you think is best for your kid, but you shouldn't be forced to send your kid into a government run school where you feel like your kid's being brainwashed for 13 years. But if you freely choose to send your kid to a private school that aligns with your values, I have no problem with that. Um, whether, whether that's this or that type of curriculum. A lot of these battles have been been about CRT, for example, in the public schools. And, uh, you know, I don't really take, take a stance on pro or anti CRT, especially because people have a lot of problems even defining what it means. And it right. means one thing to one person, and another thing to another person. The problem with for me is that we we force kids to go into the I mean, some parents may want CRT, whatever they define that to be, and they might just think that the teacher is teaching it in a biased way, and maybe another institution does a better job of showing both sides, and maybe a parent wants that. Um, so all of these issues have really just shown, uh, and I think they're not going to go away anytime soon as well because of social media, to, to your point, that there's always going to be a problem. It, it, maybe it's CRT yesterday. The, the battles of CRT today were the battles of common core of yesterday. There'll be something else tomorrow. And when people have a look at what's going on in that one size fits all model, you're always going to have someone upset about it because people fundamentally disagree about how they want their kids raised. And um, that's a bad thing for the the status quo monopoly government run school system in the long run, but it's a good thing for parental rights and education going forward. They're going to keep paying attention. They're more mobilized than ever. They're watching and they're not just going to sit down and shut up no matter how many times members of the establishment try to, try to label them as domestic terrorists, which I've, I'm sure you saw what happened yeah. with the National School Board Association. They, they're the, the regional school board association now. 19 states have already pulled their membership or funding from that organization. I mean, it even goes even more basic. You know, 100 years ago, the anarchists like Emma Goldman were complaining about public education. And one of the points that I would make, which I'm sure you'd agree with, is it's insane that a room, th room full of 30 individual students should have to all learn the same things in the same way. At a young age, kids might have different kinds of aptitudes. Maybe that young girl has a way with words and she's on her track to be a writer and she's really good at that. Maybe there's a kid who's bad at math, but he's really good at taking things apart and putting them back together uh, so that they all have to sit 
And also the fact that little kids want to run around just like little puppies or little cats or little any animals, but they have to sit still quietly. You know, boys and girls are also different in that regard. And they have to listen to things that many of which certainly at an early age, not, but later like middle school that they'll have no use for. I remember very well that I learned as a kid in Brooklyn, how to calculate the dew point and to figure out at what point the earth is saturated from too much rain, which is something that as an adult, I can look up at any time. And it you know, made no sense for me to learn. This was a holdover from the Cold War when the Russians launched Sputnik and JFK freaked out. So we had to have science in schools for some reason. But you know, anyone, you know, regardless of their ideology, if you sat down and said, does it make sense to you that a room full of 30 diverse kids have to learn the same things at the same pace and the best way and only way is by sitting and listening to a person, no one would say this is the best way, but yet this is somehow the best way for everyone across America that's nonsensical. Well, and just think about how we learn before we start kindergarten, right? We learn things not through sitting in an institution for years and years and being lectured the entire time. You learn through experiences. After you graduate high school, you do the same thing. You look right. up stuff, you read a book, you talk to experts in the field, you find information that you're interested in. And I think that's how real learning actually occurs. Even for me, when I was going through K through 12, I attended government run schools and I did a very good job. I got the very high grades and stuff and uh, went on to college. But even then, even though I did a good job in class, I think it's only because I would read the, the material before class at home and learn how to do the math problems and stuff before we even went into the classroom. And when I was being lectured to, I felt, felt like the, the information just wasn't really clicking. I had to do it on my own. I think that's just more natural way of, of learning. And another silver lining of the pandemic is that there's the the rise in homeschool and homeschooling. Yeah. Government schools have lost at least 1.5 million students nationwide, according to the latest federal data. It's about 3.3 percent of the government school population has has declined. And then homeschooling, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, has increased um, at least doubled since pre-pandemic wow. levels. And that's seems like it's continuing going forward. And then one more thing: Ed Choice, a, a school choice advocacy group, has done a a lot of polling with morning consult a third party and ever since april of 2020 they they home they they um asked the general american population what they thought about homeschooling and how their their views changed relative to pre-pandemic levels every single month that they did this survey they found that families were over twice as likely to say that they're now more favorable of the of the idea of homeschooling than they were before, over twice as likely to say more favorable as opposed to less favorable. So homeschooling views are, are going in the right direction as well. And people are voting with their feet. Charter school enrollment jumped by 7.1% according to the latest data that I've seen nationwide, while the government schools lost 3.3% of their, their population. You know, it, there, I'm going to make a parallel that's going to upset a lot of people, but I'll stand by it. I think the homeschooling movement in certain ways uh, has something in common with the gay rights movement because it was very easy to be homophobic until more and more people started coming out. And then it was someone's uncle or your coworker, and you're like, wait a minute, this guy's fine. I don't, I can't hate him. Uh, same thing with homeschooling coming from Brooklyn. I was given a certain percentage of perception that homeschool kids are freaks. Uh, they're all want to be serial killers. Um, and that the only reason people have homeschooling is like in the words of Tina Fey, who's too smart for her own good, that they want to be taught that Jesus rode dinosaurs to church. And then I met some homeschooled kids and I was like, I've been completely lied to. These kids are very self-confident. They know how to talk to adults respectfully, but not awkwardly. They are intellectually curious. They love to learn as I love to learn when I was a kid. There's no, in my opinion, there's no better way to get kids to hate learning than send them to a government school and force them to sit behind a desk and listen to someone drone for eight hours. So I, I don't, there's no way to say this in a creepy way, but if anyone is friends, has family friends whose kids are homeschooled, just talk to them for three minutes and right away you'll see not only will you see that your misconceptions have been correct, you'll realize that you've been lied to because mm -hmm. it's impossible to have a familiarity with kids who have been homeschooled and have this perception that they're somehow worse off than the kids who went to government schools where they're often the subjects of violence and have no recourse, but to be trapped in that classroom with the person who's, if not physically, psychologically bullying them. Yeah, if you look at the latest uh, systematic peer-reviewed study on the topic by Brian Ray in 2017, I believe it's in the Journal of School Choice, he looked at the data on homeschooling and found that 
the preponderance of the evidence finds that the kids do better academically, no worse socially, and uh, overall the evidence is positive. And you know what's interesting is a lot of people will go straight to the socialization argument. They'll yeah. say that kid, that homeschool kids, um, you know, they don't get the right socialization. But look, they don't get a lot of the negative forms of socialization: the bullying, the physical violence, the uh, the drugs at school, the gang activity. There's uh, the indoctrination of 13 year, for 13 years that doesn't align with your parents' values. Oh, here's There's another so one. What about the idea that your self-esteem and your uh, measure of your own intelligence has to be outsourced to the authority from the room? So instead of knowing if I'm smart or understand something, I got to wait for the results of this test from this person who's often going to be judging me on personal reasons and not factual ones. Yeah, and it, and it, it can crush the um, confidence of the student just uh, just constantly it's it's obedience training essentially and so those are negative forms of socialization i would argue that a lot of that gets lost in the weeds of these discussions and look kids can be um you know and with homeschooling and, and other even homeschool co-ops they can interact with other students and you can have your your your, your child be enrolled in, in sports where they can uh uh, socialize with other individuals as well. So there's other ways to socialize. It doesn't have to be in a government-run factory model school where a lot of the times, what what your teacher do when you try to socialize? They tell you stop socializing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they don't, don't really <laughs> encourage the positive socialization either. Hey guys, you're welcome. With Michael Malice is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket, a good speaker, that new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who switch to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles in your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service day or night. They have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casual Insurance and Affiliates, national annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all state situations. Guys, I love crowd health and working with them because if you're uninsured right now, I get it. Even with insurance, healthcare costs are out of control. Nothing is stopping insurance companies and hospitals from continuing to raise their prices, and there's enormous incentive for them to do so. But thanks to CrowdHealth, you don't have to choose between rolling the dice or paying through the nose for some peace of mind. CrowdHealth isn't health insurance, and that's how it works. Because with insurance, you pay huge premiums, but you get huge deductibles, which means on top of the thousands you pay to keep your plan, you're paying thousands more before insurance kicks in one penny. One in six claims are denied by healthcare.gov plans, which is why so many people take their chance without insurance. CrowdHealth gives you a new way to pay for healthcare because there's no doctor networks, there's no huge premiums or no high deductibles, and there's no surprises. So CrowdHealth puts community back in community healthcare and gives its members access to high quality care for up to 60% less in the process. You pay one low monthly total, you fund your account, and you get access to the CrowdHealth community, which is less than $200 a month for most people. 100% of your contribution directly funds and reduces the healthcare costs of the community. How they lower your costs? They make payment to doctors and members as quickly as possible, and they negotiate on the community's behalf when unexpected bills arise, which totally reverses the vicious incentives that got the healthcare system into this mess in the first place. Are you ready for a better way to pay for healthcare? Join the crowd. Right now, you can get your first six months for just $99 a month. That's almost 50% off normal price at a lot less than a high deductible healthcare plan. Just go to joincrowdhealth.com and use promo code welcome at sign up. That's joincrowdhealth.com, promo code welcome. CrowdHealth is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for healthcare. Terms and conditions may apply. Let's get back to the show. <laughs> um, so uh, the education was a major issue. Are you still in DC, living in DC? Yeah, unfortunately. So uh, you were right next door, obviously, to Virginia. This was a huge issue in last year's Virginia's gubernatorial race. Um, can you, I mean, you were close to the ground on this issue far more than most of the listeners. Yeah. Can you give me your recap of how that issue played out in that race, in the debates, and what were the consequences? Yeah, so it turns out it's not a good idea to say on the final debate stage that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. That was Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat yeah. contender for governor 
last debate. The Yunkin team capitalized on it, the Republican team, and just cut ads out of it and continued pressing home and leaning in to the idea that parents should have a say in their kids' education. The problem with Terry McAuliffe is he didn't really backpedal off of that. He kept going into major mainstream media outlets, quadrupling down on the anti-parent rhetoric. And he even had Randy Weingarten, the most disliked uh, teachers union boss of our time, in my opinion, stump for him the night before the election. And even on CNN, uh, I think a couple of days after the election, one of the mothers in Virginia even said that that was the nail in the coffin moment for her when Terry picked Randy to stump for him the night before the election. The school closer was the campaign closer. And I think it's partially because um, Terry, Terry McAuliffe was kind of in a tough predicament, right? He has he was reliant upon um, these major campaign contributions from the teachers unions. And so he was essentially in a catch-22 situation. If he came out uh, with per, uh, uh, in favor of parental rights, well, then his boss, Randy Weingarten, would be mad at him. If he came out against parental rights like he did, well, what you had was these upset parents who are paying more attention than ever in their kids' education who are upset about school closers and upset about what's being taught to their kids in the classroom. They came out in full force. And if you look at the latest or the... Uh, the exit polling by Washington Post, they found that in the gubernatorial race, although you know Yunkin won by about two percentage points in a state that went 10 percentage points to Biden the year before, it was a massive swing in 12 One percentage points. Yeah. So the, uh, it's huge. And Washington Post found that with education voters, that, that listed education as their number one issue, Yunkin won with them by six percentage points, a Republican, which doesn't really happen like ever with Republicans uh, in the past, at least. And, and education was the number two issue in the election, according to the same exit polling by Washington Post, second to only jobs in the economy. So this was, this was huge. And it's I think more politicians across the nation are starting to figure out that it could be politically profitable to support parental rights in education, and it could be politically devastating to come out against parental rights in education and transparency uh, when it comes to K-12 education as well. So um, I think this, these victories when it comes to school choice policies and uh, protecting parental rights in other ways and, 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 and homeschooling rights, I think that's only going to continue to expand going forward because parents uh, and the reality is parents are going to fight for the right to educate their kids as they see fit harder than anyone will ever fight to take that right away from them. Yeah. So politicians would be wise to listen to them going forward, just like uh, Glenn Youngkin did. And it's also the kind of thing where word of mouth does an enormous service, right? If I'm a parent and I had a bad experience growing up and I've been of the belief because of my generation, there was no school choice, that this is just school sucks for everyone. This is how it is. And then I have another neighbor or coworker or something like that, and their kids are having a different experience and their kids are thriving and are learning. It's like, wait a minute, why am I putting my kid through what I went through when I had these options? Isn't it the case that some astronomical percentage of the teachers union money goes to the Democratic Party? Oh, yeah. If you look at, I mean, we already talked about Randy Weingarten. The AFT is the second largest teachers union in the United States. And if you look at the Open Secrets website, you'll see that going back to the beginning of their database in 1990, in every single election cycle over the past three decades, 97% or more of the campaign contributions from the American Federation of Teachers went to Democrats as opposed to Republicans or uh, uh, independents. And I think in most election cycles, it was actually over 99%, but the lowest one was 97%. And so this is also why it's politically profitable for Republicans in particular to lean into right. educational freedom because they're in a win-win situation. This new special interest group is paying attention, parents, so you can get their vote. And then at the same time, just talking about anything when it comes to parental rights and education or, or, or educational free, school choice, uh, transparency when it comes to public schools, the, their opponents, the Democrats, are kind of in this catch-22. I would argue that, that Democrats and Republicans should both stick with parents because parents care about their kids more than anybody else, and there's more parents than union members. So in the long run, it's a, it's a better strategy for both parties to listen to the needs 
of the families uh, and their kids rather than the teachers unions. And Randy, <laughs> Randy Weingarten's on the on on the the, the 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 wrong side of history. She's um, turning off all, all of the replies on her Twitter account. Yeah. Because you know people aren't taking this crap anymore, and they don't want their kids to be forced for 13 years in a failing government school without exit options. That's that's atrocious. It's an indefensible position. I think we've won the war when it comes to logic for school choice yeah. and, and educational freedom. And now it's about mobilizing parents, um, and they already are mobilizing. I don't mobilize. I don't really have to do anything um, because look, parents are fed up, and they're they're not gonna they're, they're not they're not gonna sit down and shut up and forget about what they saw uh, over the past couple of two. A uh, couple of years. You know, this issue hits very close to home to me because I was an immigrant and we came here with absolutely nothing. My parents couldn't even speak English, but I got an edu- uh, a scholarship into a religious school. And I don't know if I didn't have that, if I would be in the position that I am today. So m- my thoughts always go to these kids in the poorest neighborhoods who are often coming from households, which are just absolutely terrible. And then when you listen to the Randy Weingartens and so on and so forth, they will tell you that these inner city schools are a complete disaster and the walls are crumbling and the textbooks are in the 50s, so on and so forth. It's like, wait, 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 you're doing everything in your power to make sure that these poor kids who have no resources are going to these schools and have no choices. This is just to me completely unconscionable. And I, I, my understanding is the parents in these kind of neighborhoods are first and foremost to like, I don't have anything, but the one thing I can have for my kid is an opportunity to have a better education. Yeah, totally. And if you look at the data on the existing school choice programs and charter schools, the lower income populations are more likely to, to, to use these types of programs or access charter schools than the general, uh, than, the, than the traditional public schools or the, what I would call the government run schools. And look, in New York City, the latest data that I've seen from the Census Bureau is from 2019. It's probably a lot higher now, but they spent over $35,000 per student per year, and they're failing a lot of kids. If you look at Chicago, they were trying to keep the dang school cl- schools closed into 2022. I couldn't believe Chicago Teachers wow. Union went on strike uh, at the beginning of this year. I mean, it was essentially like, I mean, they, they had already received over $8,000 per student in, in these federal bailouts for COVID relief in Chicago, and they were trying to keep the clo- schools closed. At that point, it was essentially like the hostage takers took the ransom payments and then kept the hostages. It was just absolutely ludicrous. It's a never-ending cycle, and the average private school tuition in Chicago, I want to say, is only like $13,000 per kid. Why not just give that money to the parents and let them figure it out? Um, and, and look, the reality is the most advantaged families are at least more likely to have school choice. They're more likely to be able to live in the neighborhoods that are assigned to the best quote unquote public schools. They're more likely at least to be able to afford to pay for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. Funding students directly would allow for more families to access educational opportunities. So in that sense, school choice is an equalizer. And the biggest thing for me that just never makes sense until you think about it for a couple of seconds is that a lot of the same people who oppose funding the student directly for K-12 to education, they're all on board with it when it comes to higher education and pre-K. We have Pell Grants for low-income students for higher education. We have the Head Start program for pre-K where you can pick, you know, public, private, religious, or non-religious. We have food stamps where the money goes to the person and you can pick Walmart or Trader Joe's. It doesn't go straight to a residentially assigned government run grocery store. That would be absolutely ridiculous. And the same people that support funding individuals as opposed to buildings with everything else, they get all up in arms about it only when it comes to K-12 education. And the obvious reason for that is that there's a difference in power dynamics. That choice is the norm with higher education, pre-K and just about everything else, but choice threatens an entrenched special interest only when it comes to the in-between years of K-12 education, the teachers unions. And so, of course, they fight as hard as possible against any change to the status quo. And, and we're seeing it all over Twitter, right? Whenever a bill is introduced, they freak out and act like the government schools are going are just going to be destroyed, which is totally the opposite of the truth. If you look at the preponderance of the evidence, 25 of 27 studies suggest that private school choice competition leads to better outcomes in the public schools. Why? Because 
School choice is a rising tide that lifts all boats. Competition works in K-12 education just like it does in higher education, pre-K, and everything else. And also, it's a, me- if it's, it's a market mechanism that if I have some kind of educational innovation in my school, it would cost me nothing in the other school to steal your ideas and uh, have practices that adapt and work, especially as technology changes, how people receive, especially children, receive information and, and adapt to it and, and, and so on and so forth. You earlier talked about how um, some parents were referred to as domestic terrorists. Uh, for those who aren't aware, can you give me the background of what that uh, incident was and w- what happened as a consequence of it? Yeah, so the National School Board Association actually sent a letter to the Biden administration uh, requesting that they essentially implying that some parents should be uh, labeled as domestic terrorists for showing up at school board meetings. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I I thought they were saying this as a colloquialism. They were saying legally they should be. They said that that some parents should be investigated for potential domestic terrorism. They actually used the words domestic terrorism oh. in, 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 the, in the letter, and they even invoked the Patriot Act in the wait, letter, wait, okay. too. I, it was I did not completely, know this. Yeah, this is why their, their whole organization is imploding, because it's just totally ridiculous. And But the worst part about this is it's, it, they're just saying the quiet part out loud. I think these people actually be, like think this way in, pub, in, in private, and they say these things at the bar, and they're like, oh, yeah, those darn domestic terrorist parents. And then when they say they let the mask slip, it turns out that, you know, most people don't think that your kids belong to the government. And most people don't think that uh, it's unreasonable for parents to show up at school board meetings. And if there is any violence that's occurring, that's absolutely uncalled for, obviously, but that should be taken care of by the local law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, Has there been any violence? Not from what I can tell. I think they cited in their letter one. Uh, instance of uh, a, a parent getting upset, and that actually turned out to be this instance where, but it wasn't terrorism. Was I want to I want to call it terrorism. I think the parent was upset because his his daughter um, was allegedly raped in right. Loudoun County Public Schools, and that was one of the the citations that they used in their letter. Uh, but look, um, it wasn't actual terrorism. It seemed like more of a letter just to bully and silence parents into submission. They didn't want any. Um, parents showing up at the school board meetings to voice their opinions against their ideologies in the schools. I, I, I got to interrupt you because my head's still spinning because I dude, really thought this this was when I saw this domestic terrorism. I thought, okay, they're being hyperbolic. They're saying they're they, they were to in these, their letter. They were they were hyperbolic in their letter. They're not being they're being literal in the letter. Is my point? Like I thought they were saying, oh, these parents who show up are yelling, are acting like domestic terrorists, blah blah. And like, okay, whatever. You roll your eyes. I didn't realize they were literally calling for legal and and uh, 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 consequences for these parents and asking the yeah. state to come in and investigate them under those auspices. Yep. And, and the Biden and there was FOIA documents that I, I don't remember who it might have been Americans for Public Trust, but FOIA documents re, uh, revealed that the Biden administration had colluded with the National School Board Association before the letter was even sent to the Biden administration. Wow. Okay. Um, so there was some funny business going on there. Um, but look, the National School Board, it, it turns out it's not a good idea to, 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 to label your potential customers as domestic terrorists, because within just the past couple of months, 19 states have already announced that they're pulling their membership or their funding from the National School Board Association. That's why I joked earlier that they should actually be called the Regional School Board Association. Yeah. And it's their own dang fault. And the reason why we're having so much educational freedom in other ways with the funding following the child it's the teachers union's own fault they're actively destroying their own empire by showing their true colors and showing families why choice and education is so important and i think it's because the teachers unions and other establishment organizations have been so drunk on power for so long they, they can't seem to reverse course. I mean, just the other day, Randy Weingarten deleted a tweet that was essentially a quote from a Washington Post article that uh, was saying that parents showing up at school board meetings were, were racist uh, for, for pushing back at the school board meetings. And she deleted it probably because she understood that she was going to get blowback. But um, look, uh, this, this isn't going to fly anymore. Uh, Parents are, are, are really upset about whatever they're getting in the, in the government schools. And that's just, that's just not going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. Um, so 
were those 19 uh, state school boards, they did this directly as a result of this letter? So they they cited, it depends on each individual state, right? Sure. But but um, some of them cited that this was, you know, just the, another thing from long going issues. Okay. I think Florida's, for example, they had already cut their funding the year before. So that's an interesting story out of Florida. But then they put out a statement saying like, oh, this is another, this is, you know, we obviously don't agree with this. This is why we, this, is, this kind of stuff is why we pulled our funding last year. And this letter is another, and um, good reason why we're not going to renew our membership this year either. But other states had pulled it like right right after the NSBA. So it, it depends on the state, but a lot of other states had said that uh, NSBA had been political with, with other things too. They didn't get real specific, but it seemed like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Hey, you ever feel like you're being followed around the internet and maybe advertisers know a bit too much about you? Well, our sponsor, IP Vanish VPN, is here to help you take back your privacy and help you become anonymous on the internet. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, which means VPN, and it's an important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. So you can use a VPN on your computer, your tablet, your phone, wherever you're streaming media. And when you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching. <clears throat> Whatever it is that you're doing, and that's important because we're doing an internet, it's no one's business but yours. And for listeners of your welcome, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off the annual plan. It's only $375 a month. IP Vanish is super easy to use. Turn it off one click. It runs in the background to help protect you while you're browsing the web. And if you do run into a problem, no worries, you boomers like myself. IP Vanish has 24-7 support available by email, chat, and telephone. All you have to do is go to ipvanish.com slash malice. And use promo code MALICE, that's M-A-L-I-C-E, to claim your 65% savings. Their annual plan is just $44.99 for the first year with our exclusive discount. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and their current promotion, you can get a VPN for 65% off the usual offering. And IP Vanish is the best of the best. They've got a 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot with over 6,000 reviews. A lot better than I'm rated. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash MALICE to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. Let's get back to the show. Um, can you talk about, you were saying that now how many 26 states have introduced bills to have the um, funding follow the student instead of the system? Are those states simply the red states? Like, how is it breaking down? Uh, it depends on the state. I mean, um, most, of, most of our success in 2021 was with red states, but there were a couple blue state, you know, expansions or um, uh, at least preventions of the program being demolished, for example, in in Illinois, a blue state, they they extended their program by a couple of years, and they have another bill this year to to totally get rid of the the sunset of the program to, to so that it doesn't get destroyed in a couple uh, taken off the books in a couple of years. Um, Hawaii has a bill that was just introduced wow. pretty recently, but you know the reality is uh, we don't expect that the Hawaii bill is going to pass just because of the makeup of uh, the state legislatures. Uh, it's much more likely to happen in red states or purplish states than in blue states. Uh, that's that's just the reality. Um, and and again, it's not because constituents who are Democrats don't support school choice. If you look at the latest Real Clear Opinion research polling on the on the on the topic, for example, one there was a ten percentage point jump in support between April of 2020 and June of 2021, from 64 to 74 percent wow. support. And the biggest jump was among Democrats, I believe is about 11 or 12 percentage point jump in support. And in June 2021, 70% of Democrats on the ground, as far as constituents supporting the concept of school choice nationwide. And the number for Republicans was like 83 or 84%, a little bit higher, but majorities across party lines, even when you look at uh, not just nationwide, but in individual states as well. Uh, But when it comes to the, the legislators, Democrats sometimes support it, and that's great. I applaud them for that. But they're much less likely to support, I think, because of the influence of Randy Weingarten and the teachers' unions. Um, it's it's not about logic. It's it's about it's about power dynamics, and and that's a problem. But I think with this new special interest group with parents showing up um, and not going away anytime soon, I think those power dynamics might shift going forward. And hopefully more Democrats start to side with parents as well. And it becomes a nonpartisan thing. I mean, one example that I like to point to from just a couple of weeks ago and, and at the end of last year, 
North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper has been a staunch um, uh, an enemy of school choice. He's a Democrat. Pride. He's a Democrat. And he has never issued a school choice week proclamation, which, you know, it's just a proclamation. It's not actually you know, a new program or anything, but yeah. he, he issued one this year. And he's never done that before, which is a step in the right direction. And in his budget at the end of 2021, he's vetoed every other budget, first, first of all. And in 2019, when he, he vetoed a budget, he said that one of the main reasons for doing so or a primary concern was that there was an expansion of their private school choice program. And he didn't really like that. But this year, past year in 2021, he signed his first ever budget, which had a massive expansion of their private school choice program. And to be fair, he did label, you know, point out here, you know, there was the good outweighed the bad, he said, and he said there's some things that he did like and didn't like, but he didn't mention school choice as being one of the things he wow. liked or didn't like. So he, instead of coming out hard against it, like he did in 2019, he signed it first of all, and then he didn't, he didn't touch the issue of school choice, I think, because uh, it's just so unpopular to come out against parental rights or and money following the child. There was a clip, I believe that you had shared of an African-American legislator where he was on, what, what state was this? Nebraska Senator Justin Wayne, he's awesome. Yeah, it was amazing because he got up there and he said he had been on the fence um, and he's like, I'll fight this. I'll kill this school choice bill if all of you promise to send your kids to that crappy neighborhood school. And he's and like, put your money where your mouth is. And, it, you know, sure, as a politician, I'm going to assume he's a sociopath who's grandstanding. But at, when push comes to shove, he was saying the right things. And it certainly seemed and I don't think it's that much of a stretch. That he's like, wait a minute. Like you're talking about my constituents. They're, they're, why are you taking away the ability for them to have options just because they're poor? Yep. And he voted for the bill last year. He voted for the bill this year as well. And that, that first video where he said, like, I'll kill this bill if you just send your kid to the failing government schools in my district. He said that last year. And then this year he got back on the stand and said, hey, I, you know, I asked you guys last year, did anybody uh, take me up on my challenge? He looks around the room. <laughs> It's like, oh, nobody, nobody sending their kids to the failing public schools in my district. And um, he voted for it again this year. It didn't get the two thirds uh, majority it needed to overcome a filibuster. It had majority support in the, in the, the Nebraska unicameral legislature, but it didn't have, it, it felt like five board votes short of the, the two thirds majority. Um, so yeah, he, he, he said the right things, but he also did the right thing when it came to uh, supporting the bill with his vote. And one other good example is in Georgia this week, there's going to be a hearing on House Bill 999, a universal education savings account, which wow. for listeners, for listeners, education savings account is the, the gold standard of school choice. It's yeah. what most of these states are introducing. The money that would have followed you to the government school goes into an ESA account. You can use it at a private school for tuition and fees if you want. You could also just take it to your government school and then nothing changes. You still have that option. But you could take it to a, a micro school, a homeschool co-op type of thing, private tutoring. The money can follow the child to wherever. It, it doesn't have to be a brick and mortar private school. It can be any education provider that's approved. Um, and in, in, in Georgia, this House Bill 999, it's, it's an expansive proposal. Doesn't a limit it based on income. Some of these programs do, and then they expand over time. But this one, no uh, income caps. And it's the full, I want to say nearly all or all of the state level taxpayer funded education dollars would follow the child. So it's pretty expansive. It's a, it's a legit bill. And when they first dropped the bill, there were six sponsors, three Republicans, three Democrats. And one of the Democrats in particular previously had voted against school choice oh, bills, wow. including education savings accounts. And, so, and she's actually a, a co-sponsor on the bill, which is another um, indication that the tides are turning in favor of, of school choice. So let's play the counter argument, devil's advocate, which is the only reason you're in favor or you or these people are in favor of school choice is because you resent being taught, kids being taught not to be racist CRT, uh, critical race theory is not being taught in school, as you know, that's a graduate level education thing. <laughs> and you just resent having kids taught not to be prejudiced. I said earlier that I don't care what the curriculum is. The problem is the one size fits all government school system that forces everything on everyone. Like these curriculum bans, for example, the CRT bans in some states, I don't think that's the, the, the right approach, right? Um, instead, 
I want freedom rather than force. And no family should be forced to send their kid into a, into a school system where they're they're not being taught with with the values that that align with them. And if you want to take your taxpayer funding to a private school that has social emotional learning or or things that aren't um, if critical race theory, if you want to do that, go ahead. Um, that's not for me to say. I just don't want families to be forced into a system that doesn't align with their values. That's the problem. Um, so yeah, um, that, that's, that's the response that I pretty much gave you earlier. How much, I, I'm, I can only imagine what the reactions have been from teachers unions and individual government teachers um, all over America as a result of social media. Are they aware of how quickly things are slipping from their grasp? I think they're free. I mean, they're freaking out, obviously, but okay. they they continue they 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 continue to come out against parents. And uh, you know, Randy Weingarten with her tweet from earlier this week, pretty much labeling parents as racist. She she was quoting a a Washington Post article uh, that said racist racist parents are showing up to school board meetings. Um, so they're still slipping up. And again, I think it's because they're so drunk. They've been so powerful for so long that they didn't really have to think about what parents yeah. actually cared about. But now we're seeing all this massive success with school choice. And it seems like many of the major teachers union bosses can't seem to reverse course. Some of them are kind of backpedaling pedaling a little bit. I mean, you look at the, for example, the Michigan Democratic Party. I don't know if you saw the post. Oh, that was Facebook great. Post. God, yeah, I went viral. It. Yeah. So, so, so like, they shouldn't have posted it in the first well, place. Can you tell, right? them, pe tell people what the post was? Yeah, I mean, it was like two paragraphs. So I don't remember the exact quote, but it came off as anti-parent. They were pretty much, it was, the, it, it was the sentiment that it takes a village, that, that your kids learn what the community wants them to learn in the public schools. That's why this is so important. You know, parents shouldn't have a say in their kids' curriculum. It didn't say exactly that, but that was the gist of the post. And it got backlash, obviously. I'm going to pull it up. Yeah. If I can. Yeah. So you can pull it up while I continue to explain yeah, yeah. it, but they deleted it. And after they deleted it, um, they, they kind of issued a quasi apology where, where they even said like this, the, the previous post didn't represent the views of the Michigan democratic party, but it's like, you posted it. It's from yeah, your yeah. verified account. So, so does this apology not represent the views of the Michigan democratic party? Either? So here, that, here was the, the quote. Um, so it says, not sure where this, Parents should control what is taught in schools because they are our kids is originating. But hold on a sec. The, but parents do have the option to send their kids to a hand-selected private school at their own expense if this is what they desire. The purpose of a public education and public school is not to teach kids only what parents want them to be taught. It is to teach them what parent, what society needs them to know. The client of the public school is not the parent, but the entire community, the public. That was the quote. Yeah, your kids belong to the it's it's bad in a couple of ways. One, it's bad because it's the sentiment that your kids belong to the government. And then right. two, oh yeah, you 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 poor people, you can't afford to pay for a private school. You should you don't get you don't deserve school choice. I mean, yeah, it was like you you can already choose things. You can pay for a private school out of the pocket, but it's but but don't you support scholarships for higher education and pre-K and everything else? Why, why are you, why is this sentiment of, Oh, you can just pay for it yourself only coming out when it comes to K to 12 education, uh, obviously because they're major donors, the teachers unions aren't happy with people getting a choice because they want your money, regardless of how well they do, regardless of the desires of the family. And now as we, as we've seen in two years now in Michigan, regardless of whether they even open their doors for business, Detroit public schools uh, last week, were still closed. Flint, Michigan, close their public schools indefinitely they don't even have a reopening date seriously set. indefinitely and look flint public schools uh latest data that i've seen spent spend over twenty one thousand dollars per student per year detroit public schools are are slated to spend over twenty six thousand dollars in 2022 according to their own budget numbers this is absolutely atrocious and it's about time we give the money to the parents and michigan has a proposal to do so they so in 2021, you know, I said 19 states had expansions yep. of school choice. Michigan was one of those states where the where two bills got through the legislature 
but the dang governor vetoed it, Governor Whitmer, and blocked, blocked the bill. But Michigan has this weird thing that if you get enough signatures, it's not a ballot initiative. You just go out, do a signature drive. If you get enough of those, I think they need like 320,000 signatures. You can override the veto of the governor by sending it back to the legislature, and you don't, and then you won't need a two-thirds majority wow. or whatever it is. So they're doing that now. It's called the Let Kids Learn Initiative in Michigan. I've been pumping it out on my social media, and I'm confident they're going to get those signatures and override the veto of Governor Whitmer, and we'll have another state that it currently doesn't have any private school choice programs at all in Michigan. They have charter schools, but they don't have any uh, tax credit scholarships, vouchers, or education savings accounts. And this, this would be an education savings account. He gave me a book on art forgery. I found myself drawn to these old masters. How did these artists take paint from a palette arrange it on a canvas, I began to unlock the secrets. I was a storehouse of knowledge of how to create an illusion, present it to a experienced expert, manipulate his mind, and convince him and bring him to the inevitable conclusion that the painting is genuine. We flooded the market with my paintings, and I couldn't believe what I did. I couldn't believe it. Then the dominoes started falling, and eventually the FBI were led to my door. They uncovered a mountain of evidence against me. But they never actually got you. At this point, you've sold a lot. You've got like a million dollars in cash. You <laughs> sold one painting for 717000 why did it go away? Why did you never get indicted? And how are we having this conversation? <laughs> I guess that's the greatest story of all. To hear how Ken Perenni made millions in art forgery, dodged the mafia and the FBI, subscribe to The Jordan Harbinger Show and check out episode 282 in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Well, I, I mean, again, this is a reason why I'm so hopeful for the future of this country, because in order to get people to believe certain nonsensical things that a lot of us take for granted, you really got to get them when you're young. And when you get them when you're young, the first thing you teach them is the person that's front of the room is smarter than you, which they are. You're a kid that they're an adult, but they know what they're talking about and what they're presenting to you as fact is maybe sometimes erroneous, but kind of within one standard deviation of a fact. So by the time you get to high school, you can teach them whatever the heck you want. And people are just going to have been trained for 12 years, their entire life as children to kind of be obedient and submissive to that message. But if the kids are taken away from that, and here's the other thing, if you just even have like 10% of the population who hasn't gone through this kind of conveyor belt, now they're in a position on social media to be like, I never heard any of this. And what you're saying is complete nonsense. And what about A and what about B and what about C? And the kids in government schools are not taught to even question a, B, and C. And as soon as they're challenged, they're either going to push back or they're going to like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. So this is really a house of cards where you need near complete control and monopoly over the population in order to maintain it. Uh, because otherwise, you know, this goal of creating good citizens, which is such a euphemism, really falls apart quickly. Yeah. And, and, and Michael, they, they're not taught to question A, B, and C, but they are taught A squared plus B squared equals C squared right. year after year. And that's so important because I, I've never really had to use it all that much. And if I needed to use it, I could look it up pretty quickly. But we all remember that kind of stuff, but we don't really seem to learn very important things when it comes to government-run education. And yes, we're not taught really to question things all that much. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Yeah. So look, uh, what's, what's, I think this, you know, this is a creates problems to the rest of society, right? Like as, as a libertarian that if you have your kid going through or the vast majority of society going through the government run school system for 13 years, and it's slanted ideologically in, in a particular way towards government, uh, policies, big government policies, then this affects all other policies, uh, in society that, that could lead to more big government. Um, so if you, even if you don't care about, you know, education policy all that much, if, if you have all of your other pet policies like taxes, tax reform or whatever it is, 
you should care about K through 12 education too, because most kids are being educated in a government run school system where it doesn't seem like they're being taught to question big government as much as we'd like. Something that I enjoy that you do on social media is when you have some big politician grandstanding about public schools, you just reply to them with either you went to private school, uh, for their, their beloved anyway public schools, you just reply to them with you went to private school or you send your kids to private school. Who are, other than Elizabeth Warren, who are some of the biggest hypocrites in this regard? So you remember um, Bill Prady, I think his name was, the producer at uh, Big Bang Theory? Yeah. So he came out, uh, you know, did this anti-school choice tweet and it was about COVID and school choice. And he tried to like make this argument that, you know, Republicans are trying to kill kids. And he said, Republicans are also trying to destroy public schools at the same time, just because arguing for school choice and, and kids getting in-person instruction. He was saying that was going to kill kids and that was going to um, uh, lead, which the data did not support at the time. It obviously doesn't support now. And it was just overly hyperbolic argument. And then I quote tweeted him and said, you went to Cranbrook, which is a, which is a quote from Eight Mile, the, the Eminem, um, one, of, one of his final raps, he, he, uh, he's, he's uh, up against Clarence, I think. And he said, your real name's Clarence. You went to Cranbrook. That's a private school. Yeah. Something along the, but it was funny because this was the first time I had exposed a school choice hypocrite that had actually gone to Cranbrook. Oh, he actually had just like, yeah, in so song. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't quote tweeting him just because I was doing a reference to eight mile. I was quote tweeting him because he actually went to Cranbrook and everybody's like, no way he does it. Yes, actually he does. So I thought that one was pretty funny. Um, Did other, he acknowledge it? He acknowledged it by blocking me like they always oh, do, right? Yes, like yeah. how odd they accidentally blocked me. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but there, the, um, Joe Biden, you know, he almost exclusively attended private schools, K through 12. Um, I think there was might have been like one year or two years that he did not attend private schools. And he sent his kids to private schools, his grandkids attended private schools, which is great again, but, you know, he, he fights against school choice for others. Um uh, Terry McAuliffe in the governor's race. One of the one of the viral tweets that I had about him was what in, one of his last major media interviews was on Meet the Press, and he was talking about the Virginia public education system. And I don't remember the exact quote, but he essentially said something like, "Dorothy and I, um, we our kids, we we raised our kids in in Virginia." Right after saying like, you know, Virginia public schools are great. Uh, Virginia public education is great. Dorothy and I, we raised our kids in Virginia. Essentially, the, the way that it came off was he was implying that he sent his kids to public schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he um, sent at least four of his kids to private schools for at least part of the time. And so that like blew up in his face as well. And this is another reason why it's politically advantageous for supporters of, of educational freedom to, to be loud and proud about it as far as politicians, because a lot of the times their opponents who are against school choice for others exercise it themselves. Yeah. And this hypocrisy is just really distasteful for voters from all parties uh, and independents as well. Uh, so that blew up in the face of Terry McAuliffe, uh, Elizabeth Warren, where he said there was another one in um, Nebraska. There's this organization called I Love Public Schools. And their executive director sent her kids to private school. And it's like, you love public school so much, you sent your kid to private school. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Holy crap. Here's, the, here's, a, here's a softball for you, because I know the answer, but it's an important one. Having school choice is just going to lead to the destruction of the public school system. And without the public school system unifying us as a people, you're basically going to destroy our society. Our society is already destroyed in a lot of ways. Uh, so we have 90% of kids in government. We have 90, 83% of kids in government run schools pre-pandemic. I don't know what the numbers are total now, but we have a politically polarized society today already. And we have most of the kids in government run schools. Maybe there's a correlation there. And in fact, if you look at the preponderance of the evidence on the, on, on the topic, Private school choice tends to lead to better civic outcomes, like tolerance of other people's viewpoints. Uh, Patrick Wolf at the University of Arkansas did a couple meta-analyses on that topic, if listeners would like to 
look it up. One is called Civics Exam. That was the older one by an Education Next. But look, the reality is the money doesn't belong to the government schools in the first place. Education funding is meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting a particular institution, public or private. We should fund the student, not the system. And a lot of these same people that argue this won't ever, like, like, imagine if someone tried to say that allowing families to choose their grocery store destroyed Safeway. I mean, that wouldn't even make any sense. Who cares about Safeway then? Or they'll, they'll say it steals money from, safe, from, yeah, yeah. from the public school. Well, the money doesn't belong to Safeway in the yeah. first place. Even if you're using food stamps, the money goes to the family. They could choose Safeway if they want. Um, but if not, they don't like that for whatever reason, they can go to Walmart or Trader Joe's. And when it comes to K-12 education, again, the money is meant for the child, not for the buildings, public or private. And it really raises a question that, you know, why would giving families a choice destroy government schools? Right. If they're doing a, such a good job, then people will keep their kids there. They're essentially telling on themselves. They understand that so many families aren't happy with what they're getting in the government schools. So they're pushing for policies to trap their kids there, but disproportionately low-income kids that can't afford an escape from the failing government schools uh, for, for long periods of time. And that's totally atrocious for, for them to do so. They think you're you're the they think that your kids' education dollars belong to their buildings, regardless of, of how well they do. And look, I mentioned this earlier, but the evidence is pretty clear. 25 of 27 studies on the topic, which I could give you for the, for the show notes, find that private school choice competition leads to better outcomes in the government schools, uh, not worse. It, it doesn't destroy the government schools. It actually makes them better because competition is a rising tide that lifts all boats and a peer reviewed meta analysis from a UT Austin researcher, Jabbar, J-A-B-B-A-R and her team in educational policy. It's called, um, uh, I don't remember the name of the study but it's um, published in a journal called educational policy in 2019. They even find that when you pull all the effect sizes together from all the studies on the topic, there's an overall positive competitive effect of school choice. But even if the evidence didn't show that, the argument for school choice is, is, is not contingent upon what the, right. the academics say. Um, if a government school does a bad job and doesn't respond to competition, they, they typically do it. Do it. But if there is a particular situation where they don't, that doesn't mean that my kid should be forced to go into that right. school that's failing, that can't re even respond to competition. This is an argument for choice, not an argument against it, and it shouldn't depend on the, the competitive response of a government school. Uh, the, the, the right of a family to choose their kid's educational provider um, is, is, is more important than the competitive response uh, of a government school. Are you, it tends to be positive. Are you surprised on a personal and professional level how quickly these bills have gone through these different states? Yeah, I mean, this is the 2021 is the year of school choice, right? Uh, it's just been a, a huge success. I mean, from the last legislative session in 2020, before the year of school choice, I can remember one state that passed a new private school choice program, which happened to be Utah. They passed a new uh, ed, a tax credit scholarship program. So there's just been an, a huge uptick in, in support for school choice, according to polling, according to the movement in the state houses. And I think uh, just as far as the, the logic of the arguments for school choice have been clearer than ever. Um, you had the closed schools still getting kids money and families were just scrambling trying to find alternatives. Meanwhile, the private schools, which their average tuition nationwide tend to be about $12,000 per kid, whereas the government schools spend much over $15,000 per kid, especially after the federal bailouts. Since March of 2020, the federal government allocated at least $190 billion to K-12 education. That turns out to be three or $4,000 per student extra, in addition to the fifteen or 16000 yep. that they were already spending per child. And it just goes to show you the problems with the, the current system. It wasn't just that they could keep their doors closed and still get paid while vacationing in Puerto Rico. It's that the teachers unions understood that they could hold children's education hostage to get even more money. It's not that they didn't close down from, from doing a bad job and not providing in-person learning. 
It's that they could keep their, they could actually increase their benefits and profit from keeping the schools closed. And you can see some districts across the country still still playing games with in-person instruction now. But it's uh, the old maxim played out with COVID that I've said long before COVID, which is underperforming private schools shut down, underperforming government schools yep. get more money. Before it was based on test scores. Hey, we have low test scores because you know we're you know we're only spending thirty five thousand dollars a kid. You need to give us seventy thousand dollars per kid. Maybe it'll it'll work this time. Oh, and even though we've already increased per pupil education expenditures by uh, two hundred and eighty seven percent since nineteen sixty in real terms after adjusting for inflation, if you just give us two hundred and eighty seven more percent, yeah. then we're, just, we're, we're everything is going to be better. But the reality is we all know that's freaking bogus now because money, more money in education is not going to matter without incentives to spend that money wisely. And the best way to provide those incentives is to direct the money directly to the parents so that they can vote with their feet and provide true bottom-up accountability for the schools to listen to them and to do a better job. Corey, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, all of it. Yeah, you ask this every time and always forget about this question. I don't I don't think about it much, but um, just getting to talk to you, obviously, it's it's been a while since we've done a podcast together, but uh, also just talking about the success of, of, of school choice. It has been really amped up because this is just monumental uh, momentum and support of, of the idea of having the funding follow the child as opposed to the building. It's a great time to be a school choice advocate. Some people give me a lot of credit, but at the same time, I think we got to give an award to Randy Weingarten, the president of AFT, for inadvertently doing more to advance the concept of homeschooling, parental rights, and school choice this past these past two years than anyone could have ever imagined. I give that answer a B minus. Please stay after class. <laughs>